welcome everybody. Kia ora tato. I'm Vincent Herringer and welcome to this fourth episode of our series Otato Nahiri, produced by Pure Advantage and Tane's Tree Trust. Uh, the webisodes are being hosted by our friends at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. In today's webinar, we'll be looking at the non-timber advantages of native forests with three panel experts, Dr. Jackie Amers, a forestry, a forestry scientist, ecologist and research analyst. Edna Walker, a PhD student from the University of Waikato, who is looking at the applications of kaitiaki tanga in an urban setting. And our third uh, speaker, we really hope is going to be here soon. Um, he is having uh, some internet issues, is Hal Davis Davies, who leads Auckland Council's Urban Nahiri Programme. And please remember that we're really happy to take your questions, um, use the Q&A box on Zoom, and also check that chat window as we'll be adding more information and links there as we're talking. We have um, Belle over here, we have Simon, I think, calling in from Dunedin, maybe even Invercargill, um, who's managing the chat. Uh, we're putting up links and, and other material. We're finishing at 7.30, but of course, there's a ton of great material on our website at pureadvantage.org. And you can follow us on social, on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And of course, we'll be here next Tuesday. So let's just have a quick look at the poll. Who have we got who was turned up? Uh, kind of similar to last week, about 40% of you are foresters and farmers. Uh, a small number this time from science and academia. So um, we're going to be keeping it nice and simple, you academic types, uh, Jackie and, uh, and Edna. And, um, and then a, a nice mix of other Always curious about who's who is in the other, and um, it it looks like a good number of people have been reading the material on the website. So the advertisements are working. Thank you for doing that, and I hope you found them really interesting. And then look at that: a good number, forty percent, haven't read anything at all. So you'll discover a ton of material there that's really interesting. There's from lots of different perspectives: from foresters, academics, ecologists, from uh, iwi point of view, from uh, uh, from a commercial point of view, from a government point of view. Lots to just dis uh, discuss, and then a, a nice mix too of uh, it looks like quite a few of you know about this idea of continuous cover forestry, which is, I suppose, ultimately you know the big idea that we're hoping to bring to New Zealand have been practiced in many other countries, particularly in Europe, but we think could well apply here for our native forests. I think that we probably are not going to be joined by Hal at this stage, so um, I'd like to introduce you to our two panellists, uh, Dr. Jackie Amers and uh, Eleanor Walker, both of whom have contributed to uh, writing articles in the uh, Otato Nahiri website, When if, if you haven't read those, they're going to be put into the chat now as they introduce themselves. So first, let me start with um, you, Erina. Welcome. Um, tell us a little about yourself and what interests you in native forests? Um, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Erina Walker. Um, I am a PhD student here at the University of Waikato. Um, I grew up in Whangarei um, on the outskirts um, in a place called Otaika Valley. Um, and that's probably one of the key um, reasons for why I care for um, native forests. So we have a small forest behind our um, homestead in Otaika. Um, and so for me, I really want to provide um, my whanau, my nieces, nephews and future generations um, the same opportunities that I had in engaging with um, native forests. Um, I've recently just submitted my PhD thesis, so I'm um, very fresh um, with ideas um, and contributions to this um, to this area. I'm amazed, actually, that you can even um, stand talking about it because uh, it, everyone that does a PhD tells me it's absolutely exhausting. It's the last thing you want to do is talk about your PhD, but obviously motivated, which is great. I don't know. Thank you. And uh, Jackie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, kia ora and congratulations, Erina, on um, submitting your uh, dissertation. That's awesome. Um, I am a trustee of Tani's Tree Trust. I am a forest scientist and an ecologist and a research analyst and I have a deep love for our native forest and that has been with me right from when I was very young and I care very much about our nahiri so that's me I'm passionate and 
I also think it's really important that people have the opportunity to connect with nature, particularly uh, Indigenous species. I mean, that passion really comes out through the movie that you were in. I know that you don't like seeing yourself on screen, but um, for those of you who haven't watched the film, which is now, I think, on TVNZ On Demand, but it's also on our website, and Jackie is uh, in in the movie, and actually you get the honour of doing the um, the outro credits, don't you, Jackie? You, you, I think you're asked the question, what is your favourite tree? Yes, yes. So I started my career working in uh, Kaikatea Forest, and they are deep in my heart and soul and I spent a lot of time deep in um, swamp water going through to um, Kaikatea Forest and I had a lot of magic moments but that's our, our rarest species and it's missing from a lot of our landscapes. We've got less than two percent of the original cover remaining so it's probably our most uh, threatened, one of our most threatened uh, forest ecosystems. Yeah. In the last um, three episodes, we've looked at some of the challenges that exist for expanding uh, our nahiri. And uh, we had a couple of um, big gnarly questions like, where would you plant it? You know, where would the land come from? We also discussed last week, um, not just where would the land come from, but how do you expand the existing estate? Um, how do you help restoration and recovery? The theme this, um, uh, of this episode uh, today is really talking about what are the advantages, particularly the non-timber advantages. And Jackie, I wonder if you could start, I know that you have written extensively on this, and I believe that you're also about to submit another paper or a, um, a summary with Tane's Tree Trust. So maybe you could take us through, you know, what are outside of timber, the main advantages that having a healthy nahiri provides us? There is an enormous variety, um, myriad of benefits. They include non-timber forest products, including some of the important cultural, like the traditional medicine, rongoa, and um, natural pharmaceuticals. There, there's honey, uh, native forest is absolutely critical to our honey industry and New Zealand is the biggest honey export, our uh, second largest honey exporter in the world. Uh -huh. uh, our native species provide all the, um, the early se season nectar flow that's vital to our honey industry. Um, there are environmental services that are incredibly important, carbon sequestration, uh, the production of oxygen, um, the very air that we breathe, clean water, erosion prevention, the list is, is huge and of course biodiversity and that's very very important with our native forests. Uh, they, uh, they are such an important habitat for our um, all our indigenous species and there are, there are cultural values uh, and spiritual values that are so important to us that are very difficult to try and quantify. It's basically valuing the invaluable. This includes our international reputation. It includes our sense of identity and who we are, uh, Taranga Waiwai. Uh, our, our recreation, it's, it's the ambient environment for so much of what we do as New Zealanders. Um, and it's it's really really critical in our urban areas as well as as Erina will will be talking about. Mm. Uh, that is a great summary, thanks, Jackie. It's almost as if you've written the paper on it. Um, I wonder if we could drill into some of these in in particular, and um, let's talk about um, the spiritual component. The cultural component, the bit that, as you say, is it's impossible to quantify, but anyone that can't see the value has rocks in their head. And, you know, for us as a people in New Zealand to have this connection to the land, I don't know, particularly for Māori, do you want to 
Inanna, just tell us about the connection to Nahiri and what that means for Māori, and then maybe what that might mean for us as a as a kind of a new nation, you know, that's still discovering itself. Mm, yeah, um, I think for for Māori, our connection to forests is actually established and maintained through our cultural narratives. So a lot of our storytelling, a lot of our um, um, stories about the creation of the world capture that spiritual connection and those um, cultural values that are inherent in that connection to our ngahere. And I think for wider um, Aotearoa um, New Zealand is that that opportunity to connect to our ngahere um, through those cultural narratives is open to everyone. So understanding your connection to the places you might call home, the new forests around your area, um, you can understand it a bit more strongly through some of the cultural narratives that exist um, within different areas. So you have the um, broader narratives about Tāne Mahuta um, and um, the creation of the world, but you also have cultural narratives about specific sites, um, uh-huh. forest sites um, around Aotearoa as well. So, yeah, there's the many um, ways to establish that spiritual connection. Well, give us an example, you know, what, uh, and maybe even something that's close to home where you are now in the Waikato or maybe from your home. Yep, so um, for myself, because I grew up in Whangarei, um, it's a little bit more difficult for people who move into new tribal boundaries to understand how we connect to those spaces. Um, and so for me, um, using how I would engage in Ngahiri back home, so being respectful of the place, um, learning about different um, ancestors that existed in my home spaces of Whangarei, um, taking that same process and applying it in Hamilton um, has allowed me to understand um, stories around te kingi, tanga, um, the raupatu and those kinds of stories that help me to, um, to recognise um, the importance of these sites and these resources and these forest areas to um, hapu and community. So it's just really about learning about the spaces that we live in um, and the narratives and the stories um, of those areas. Mm. One of the things that's happening at the moment is that a new appreciation of the uh, I suppose the connection to nature that we can learn from Indigenous cultures, when you do your work, particularly looking in an urban setting, what, what are beyond Māori that, you know, what kind of experiences or insights might apply to the wider population? Um, and I'm thinking I- particularly, say, in an, in an urban setting. Yeah, I think for um, urban spaces, so... Um, There are different values and concepts that um, Indigenous communities utilise throughout the world. And I think drawing on those different processes that they use to connect um, to nature in urban spaces can be valuable for even non-Indigenous people. Um, And I think that experience of being transient, moving in and out of urban spaces can provide a new process for connecting to, um, to urban nature, but also to forest areas as well. You know, the um, it's kind of visceral, isn't it? The experience of walking f- through a forest. But can you, in your PhD, what what have you learned about the connection that nature has? I don't know, physiologically or uh, emotionally on people. Yeah. So I th- um, within my thesis, a lot of my participants um, talked about the different ways that they connected. So it wasn't just about Um, that physical um, work that they would go out and collect or harvest or forest um, forage um, different resources but it was also uh, about undertaking other cultural practices um, such as karakia, um, karanga, waiata um, that captured that relationship so I think in terms of connecting um, to nature in urban spaces it takes different mechanisms to encourage that connection and to maintain that connection especially within those modernized spaces. Did you find that the same effect was able to be generated by just having, I mean, it kind of sounds ridiculous, a relationship with a tree as opposed to a forest? I guess the question is how important is it that in urban areas we develop clusters of trees, pockets of sort of mini forests? Yeah, I think um, if you if you look at it, uh, one tree is just one whanaunga, so that's just one relative. Um, and from a very Māori perspective, you need the support of the community. So I think creating these um, forest areas um, allows that form of connection to, to really grow and, and, and flourish. Um, mm-hmm. You can create a connection to one 
um, one relative, um, one whanaunga, but it's more beneficial to create that stronger holistic um, connection. Um, and that's where, where trees um, and forests and urban spaces um, provide their value and benefit. Uh, we're going to welcome Hal Davies. Um, welcome, Hal. I'm glad you're um, you're back uh, and you could join us. Um, Hal is um, uh, leads the um, Urban Nahiri program for Auckland City, and uh, so you've got some insight into the way people engage with uh, Nahiri in a urban setting. But one question before we sort of explore that, Hal, we'd love to know how you got those big pahutakawa right down into Queen Street. Well, the bottom of Queen Street. Well, they were planted as seedlings um, some 40 years ago. Um, and so we've just basically, I, I guess, acted as a kaitiaki and cared for them in that process. And um, rather than see them succumb to the chainsaw with the most recent developments in Key Street, uh, pushed pretty hard to have them dug up and moved. So, yeah, quite a um, challenging and certainly very nerve wracking exercise on times, um, all done in the dead of night. I was down there last night until 3 a.m. We've just um, finished planting the last two that have come back into Key Street. So, yeah, it's it's not the first time we've done something like that, but um, certainly one of the more memorable um, transplanting experiences I've been involved with in my career. Tell us about the, just what how big the root uh, area needs to be. I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but, you know, what what... what physically needs to happen to that um, tree it's for it to survive? Pretty, pretty major, to be honest, Vincent. Um, in, in terms of there is an actual formula, and I, I don't want to share industry secrets around that because there are people that make a living out of that. Um, in terms of... Um, <laughs> we want more people to, to, to um, transport their um, healthy trees. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not... Yeah, I, I don't really want to share somebody else's um, hard work <laughs> in, that, in that space. But it's really around the, the caliper of the trunk in relation to the size of the tree. So there is a formula that's applied. Um, so if you have a one meter circumference trunk, you might be looking at a root ball that might be somewhere in the region of around three meters mm -hmm. in circumference. So, um, the, you know, shifting a tree, um, Pahutakawa is probably one of the easier species in New Zealand. There's certainly some much more challenging, much more difficult um, tree species that are, you know, very sensitive to root disturbance, but Pahutakawa have that fantastic ability to, as you know, fall off cliffs and land on beaches and carry on growing. So um, us digging them up is is actually not that, I guess it's stressful. Um, I've not seen many lost through that process. Um, I'd say the strike rate's probably around 75 to 80% success, success rates if it's done properly. Um, the ones that we moved on Key Street, the average sort of size, I guess the trees are in that sort of 10 to 12 meter um, in height with about a 15 meter canopy spread. Their average weight um, lifted is somewhere in the region between 12 and 20 tons. Wow, that's something else. Uh, I think it'd be fair to say that not many Aucklanders would know that we have an urban forestry strategy that you have written. Uh, was the, uh, Do many people uh, are they surprised when they meet you? And um, um, how hard has it been for you to argue for uh, a, a forestry strategy for the city? Um, I think in terms of arguing for it, the, the council was ready. The, the time was right. I think the, um, you know, the removal of the RMA and some of the other major changes that were going on are sort of forced to, I wouldn't say forced the council's hand, but certainly we were heading down that direction. I mean, I've been with Auckland City Council and now Auckland Council in about five different roles now for 19 years. And I've seen two, um, possibly three tree plans come through, you know, internally, but never make it to the public. So the appetite's always been there. I think um, in terms of uh, awareness, there's a growing awareness, to be honest. I mean, this, you know, being able to provide an article to the Pure Advantage Group has been a you know, huge um, boost for myself in the sense of, you know, getting some profile out there, um, encouraging people to think about, you know, what is urban tree cover? Um, I've spoken at a number of conferences over the last few years, um, both with the Arbor Cultural Association about the work that I've been doing and um, at Green Pavlova as well, which is a parks and recreation open space conference. So I think the awareness um, is certainly growing. I've had a lot of interest from other cities now around New Zealand. Um, Christchurch is busily in the process of writing one. I know Wellington is in the same boat. 
um, Tauranga is heading down that same track. So I think it's, uh, I suppose Auckland was that, you know, we were the leader of the pack in some senses, but it's something I would, you know, think that most big urban centres in, in, in New Zealand um, really do need some kind of strategy to kind of give people a bit of a direction. Um, yeah, I think good. it's oh, sorry, may carry yeah, on. No, yeah. no, that's fine. Uh, well, yeah, we're with, very, very good at planting and walking away. Is is uh -huh. is quite a common um, thing that you probably experience in you know in the horticultural world. But I, I guess it's. A, I mean, for me, what we're trying to encourage people to think about is that trees take you know take time. There's investment required um, for it to be successful. We need to put some energy into it. Um, and the more energy we put in, the, the better the benefits that we get out of it. So, it, you know, it's it's a really positive equation if you look at it in that sense, because trees don't generally bring um, harm to us. Um, if you want to look at it that way, you, you know, most of the things they do for us in, improve our environment, provide habitat, you know, improve our livability, our connectivity to nature. Mm. Um, so there's a whole range of things that, that trees do. And I think, yeah, for me, the strategy is just highlighting those. What is the state of our, our forest in Auckland? The, the sense is that it has been in decline, particularly since 2012 when there was a change to the uh, RMA that allowed people to uh, cut down large trees. I was pleased to see in the report that uh, uh, more than a million trees have been planted since 2017. So in your assessment, in your audit, were you able to get a sense of just how much canopy cover there is in Auckland? Yeah, I guess to sort of clarify um, that our work at the moment is looking at urban tree cover within what's called the metropolitan urban limits of Auckland. Um, you know, Auckland's broken up in, it's a very big geographical area, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, we stretch, you know, all the way from Wellsford to Bombay. Mm. Um, that encompasses 21 local boards now. Um, and so of the 21 local boards, 16 of them fall within what we call the metropolitan urban limits um, and the tree canopy cover within that area. Um, there is, I guess, what we call that sort of tune that goes on where trees are cut down and trees are growing. The, the metrics that we're measuring is basically picking up any tree that's over three meters in height um, using LIDAR. Um, and I guess in terms of the general trajectory, what we're observing is that we are growing our urban forests. So in terms of the extent of canopy cover is growing certainly more this way, but it's decreasing this way. So what we're finding is that we're losing much more of the larger height category trees. So in most cases now of the 16 local boards that we've looked at, most of them have got less than 1% of their tree canopy cover is made up by trees over 30 meters in height. And so the, it was, a, was it you that talked about shrub herbs? That's right. So I've got, yeah, coined a little bit of a term going forward. Shrubberbia is what we're creating by cutting down all of our large trees. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, the amount of space that we're left with with intensification doesn't enable us to plant large growing trees. So, you know, there's certainly some really great examples of where we've, um, you know, intensified development on the site landscape architects run amok um no offense to the industry they do a fantastic job but on times i think they forget that trees actually do grow when they planted um and we see lots of instances of you know really it's it's a real pity in my view that we see these fantastic sort of urban developments going on and we get them planting things like london plane trees in a one meter wide grass Verge, which is just going to cause no end of problems for us going forward. So, you know, really trying to promote that we need to be thinking a lot more about planting the right trees in the right places. And if that mm. means that we're going to plant many more small trees, I don't think that's a bad thing in some senses, because, you know, we don't we don't have the space to plant big trees on private land. Um, Auckland Council is a very big landowner and a lot of the plantings that we do on our public estates are planting trees that will eventually grow into large specimens. So there's a balance that we're trying to address there. I obviously, you talk about the Million Trees program. That was something that our mayor um, came in on his first term of the election, and now he's running a second program. So we're looking this time around to plant 1.5 million trees over the next three years. Right. Jackie, we just talked about the, the kahikatea being absent from our, our land. And you know, there is our tallest tree. How practical is it to imagine that we could grow big, lovely, 
tall kauris and totras and kahikatiyas in an urban setting. Have you seen it? And do you have any advice about how, how that could be done? Well, there are some parts um, in, in our cities uh, where we do have um, large large trees. I mean, um, in Christchurch, and it's mentioned um, in Colin Merck's article, um, the forest in, in Rickerton, which has got beautiful big kaikatea, and that was because of someone's vision. Someone had a vision to protect that forest. So the people of Christchurch who live near there, they benefit um, incredibly from that tall forest. And it's the big trees that give the biggest benefits. And it's the big trees that when they're lost, that people grieve the most. Um, those are the trees that people identify with, the, the trees that people love, the, the trees that people have a relationship with. And, the, and, and they provide the most, most benefits. Um, do do you mean in, in some of the things that you mentioned, like carbon sequestration, uh, biodiversity, uh, habitat, and, and so on? Yes, um, particularly for um, biodiversity, um, for providing shade, uh, for intercepting um, heavy rainfall, um, which is good in terms of stormwater, for um, intercepting pollution, for um, providing shade and really ameliorating, making more pleasant the, the local environment, like in Brisbane, which is the, probably the leafiest city in the world, where they've got the urban forest retained, they have 7% um, lower temperatures, seven degrees Celsius lower temperatures, which is really quite, major in a city where you know it's basically subtropical tropical so that really shows the, the difference that that large trees can make to the um, urban environment which is even more critical now as we come in you know we're being impacted more and more more by climate change let's explore this right tree right um, place um, and look at it from two points of view perhaps Edna um, when you've looked at the uh, I suppose the responsibility that comes or is implied in that word kaitiakitanga. Uh, have you seen models of management or ways of looking after little clusters of forest that, uh, I, I don't know, might provide lessons for other parts of New Zealand? Um, I think within the practice of um, harvesting rongo, that's a, um, a, a clear model for looking after trees. And so um, just like what Hal was talking about, the, the lifespan of um, the, the, the trees is what's considered when you when you um, harvest rongo. So it's not just about harvesting the leaves or um, the sections of the tree. It's about ensuring that the, um, the longevity of their plant is taken care of from um, trimming it, um, from clearing around it um, and protecting it. And so, again, I think um, there are models within um, an Indigenous framework that can help support um, that, that type of thinking and that type of um, care for, um, for our trees and our, our native species. Mm -hmm. um, how, where are you, unpack that right tree, right place idea and how that might apply. And, and this is probably you um, describing what's in your strategy, I imagine. Um, it's just one of the principles that we've applied in there. I think it it's sort of come from the, um, you know, the willy nilly or unorganized planting that we have done. Um, and in some cases, you know, we planted definitely the wrong trees in the wrong places and they cost, you know, local authorities a lot of money to manage. They, you know, we have significant liability issues with some of the tree issues that we have to deal with. Um, and I guess sort of out of that, the, the strategy is really trying to give, I guess, myself and others that are looking at managing our urban forest clear direction on, on some of the thinking. Um, so we talk about, you know, managing the whole life cycle of our tree asset, which I think a lot of people don't realize is a really important thing. You know, we manage physical assets in terms of pipes and infrastructure. Trees need the same things, um, you know, they, they need inspections, they need maintenance, they need to be pruned away from power lines, they need to be pruned away from streetlights, 
road signs, you know, canopy lifted over the road so vehicles don't hit them. So there's a, you know, it's a reasonably complex process that we go through to manage our trees. Um, and most people don't, you know, don't interact with that. I, I know most of the trees that we prune in the CBD, for example, Auckland Central City is all done at night. So a lot of people don't actually see the work that we do in terms of, you know, nurturing, maintaining, trimming, um, you know, really trying to get the best out of our asset. So I, I guess we're looking at the sense of, you know, we're trying to really um, I keep going back to that term of, of kaitiaki. We really are the guardians. We really want to show that we, you know, have got the best interests of the public and the best interests of our urban forest, it, you know, is front of mind for us. And I think, you know, I've been involved in having to remove some really, really stunning trees that have caused significant damage you know and if only we planted that tree in the right place and not decided to plant it in a you know in a right next to a sidewalk that that's next to an apartment building that's got a basement car park that we find tree roots growing through the car park you know 25 years later there's nothing we can do about that so mm. unfortunately the tree has to be removed so i think there's you know i've learned my lesson the hard way unfortunately um as i said in sort of our um bit of a chat before we, we started the session. I mean, unfortunately, as a trained arborist and an urban forester, I mean, um, I love planting trees, but I'm involved in removing and killing them as well. So um, that's an important part. Unfortunately, we do have to make some, you know, tough decisions. And I think that the right tree in terms of unpacking it a little bit, I guess it's looking at what is the tree that we all fall into that trap of going to a nursery, a garden center, we look at the label and it says the tree is going to grow to five meters. Um, in most cases, the labeling that we see in garden centers is probably only talking about the first 10 years of the tree's life. Hmm. I mean, I've seen carry labeled with a, um, a size of eight meters on them, which we know is, is just ridiculous, but it sells plants, doesn't it? It's just, you know, people don't look at the amount of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide that's produced by their car. They look how fast it goes and how much fuel it uses. So it's kind of just looking at it in a different sense. So if we're going to plant trees, we want them to be one, we want them to be healthy and vigorous and suitable for the environment. Um, and obviously, you know, taking um, desert, desert trees, trees from high altitudes and trying to grow them in Auckland is not the greatest. You know, we've got a very wet maritime climate, so we need to recognize that. Um, the, our botanic mm -hmm. gardens has a real um, great little program they've got what's called its star performers program and so what they've done over the years is they've trialed a huge range of plants and they look at um, you know roses for example what roses can you grow without needing to use chemicals and without using to use sprays what fruit trees can you grow that you know produce high quality fruit and are less susceptible to you know fire blight and those sorts of things so mm. it's really about having a really good look about what, you know, what is the tree, you know, how big does it grow? Where are you going to plant it? And, and a lot of people fall into the trap of, you see a huge tree with a massive, you know, amazing canopy above the ground. That same architecture exists below the ground in terms of the tree's root, root system and root structure. Mm. What um, commitment is there um, out there for planting natives as opposed to exotics? And um, maybe look at it, if you answer the question, say, from an urban authority point of view, uh, uh, is Auckland Council, and maybe Jackie, you could, or uh, Edna as well, uh, are councils committed to planting and nurturing natives over and above exotics? Would you like me to start? I'd say from an Go Auckland Council perspective, yes, most definitely. Um, when we've had our engagement with and development of the Urban Nahiri strategy, with Mana Fenua, that was one of the key principles that we talked about is our preference for native is, is the terms that we use. So when we look at our tree selection, our first preference should always be looking at a native species. Um, but obviously in certain situations, there are there is that right tree, right place. Um, and, you know, solar access for people, winter sunlight, those sorts of things do become an, an issue that we do look at. Mm. Jackie, are you, are you noticing a, uh, a commitment to native trees? Yes, I think there's been a cultural renaissance here in New Zealand. Um, Maori culture. Restore the biodiversity um, and then in more urban areas, you know, our selection is a little bit wider. I guess we do look at, you know, we're 
exotic trees, for example, may be more suitable where they do lose their leaves and where we can provide solar access for people. So again, it's going back to those, you know, how does a tree grow? What does it look like? You know, what, what are the key benefits and what are the key sort of attributes that it has? Mm. Jackie? Yeah, I, I think New Zealanders are growing more and more of their own identity, and that includes what they plant and what they value. Mm. And mm -hmm. that's something that I really noticed after spending five years overseas and coming back um, in 1993. And I've seen that increase. And we've got so many people, and I'm going to do a big shout out to those people who are involved in restoration programs and land care groups, urban restoration groups. They're doing incredible jobs and they're mm. absolutely inspiring. And it does something for the soul. <laughs> it does something for communities. I've seen it personally. I have um, a twin brother who's autistic and he's been involved for the last uh, 13 years in a um, natural restoration um, projects in the Neden through the um, Shetland Street Nursery Restoration Program, which is based um, on a marae. And I have seen um, so many people pulled together and working together and the joy that they have. And they've, they've done spectacular things um, in restoring um, what had been swampy land that should never have been had the trees removed. Um, and now, you know, they're taking houses off and um, a, a field that was it got too boggy because I mean basically it needed that that forest and that wetland there and it was taken away and the hydrological services were disrupted so now they've restored a quite a, a major part of the um, Pakurai uh, up estuary but that's just one example there are so many around New Zealand and yes I think as a people we are embracing more and more the things that are special to who we are as New Zealanders, and that includes our native trees and also everything that comes along with that, of course, our native um, birds and um, um, other other species. I mean, I've got a um, an adopted nephew who's massively into wetters and stick insects and <laughs> um, very exciting, yeah, and 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 he is finding them, of course, in urban areas in, in Wellington. And I think you know that the, the uh, younger generation are um, even more, I think, inspired. And partly this is through the education system to yeah connect with nature and our own heritage, our own natural heritage. Mm, that's interesting, um, Irina. I, I wonder if there is a link between discovering New Zealand native forest and also rediscovering our indigenous culture? Yeah, I think um, like I, I support what Jackie um, just shared about the growing interest in Māori culture. Um, in my research on kaitiakitanga and urban spaces, there were many non-Māori who knew what kaitiakitanga was, who were trying to actively practice it and were really interested in um, the cultural values and the cultural concepts within te ao Māori. And so I think that has a part to play in how we value um, um, native forests and, and native species. Um, and another point um, in my research um, was that um, there were a lot of our participants were going out and collecting those native species and were um, engaging with them. So I think, yeah, um, really supporting what Jackie's um, shared previously is that people are starting to value the um, our native species, um, but also the cultural knowledge that comes with those native species as well. And I think that can contribute immensely to people's connections to um, nature in general, but also to those forests and mm -hmm. um, and. Um, different areas. I want to change the topic a little bit. Um, in your article, I don't know, you talk about access and it raises an interesting question of privilege. Uh, you quote a number of um, people in Melbourne, 340,000 people had limited or no access to parklands within a five kilometre radius of their um, time during lockdown. Uh, I, I'm sure that that statistic must repeat itself in New Zealand cities. 
Um, I think even just looking at the Auckland Urban Ngahiri strategy, the canopy cover differs from um, the, within the different um, areas in Auckland. So for low, the low income areas or, or um, towards South Auckland, they have limited tree um, canopy cover. So that's just a real clear um, example of some of the inequities that exist with access um, to urban forest and to urban nature um, more general. Uh, in a more general sense, and um, even in my own research, there were discussions shared um, from my participants about the limited access that they had um, to different rongoa um, species, to different um, food species, and so they were relying on their own networks to really um, bring those resources into urban spaces. So there are many challenges to access um, that uh, are um, can attributed to age, to um, our abilities to access, to mobility, and so on. So, yeah, it's a it's a, a can of worms, really. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, Hal, you um, would notice this, especially with your uh, sort of overview of the entire city. Just how little canopy cover there is in South Auckland. You don't even need to go, and you know. It, pay for expensive LIDAR, you just need to drive around the suburbs around Otara, mm -hmm. Apatoi, Manariwa, Mangari. You'll see that, you know, we have street after street after street of vacant grass verges, um, very little planting, even on private properties. And I think that's, you know, down to that socioeconomics as well. Um, and I think, to be fair to some of the, you know, the the smaller local councils that we used to have before the, the super city was formed. Um, some of the, the councils, you know, Waitakere City Council, Auckland City Council had quite proactive tree planting programs. Um, you know, a lot of street tree planting went on through the 80s and the 90s. Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, those areas of South Auckland have lagged way behind. Um, obviously, the a lot of people don't realise, you know, Tamaki um, around Point England is a great example that you know, large areas of Point England, um, Glen Innes, Panmua, are actually owned by Housing New Zealand or, you know, Kaingora, um, and no planting at all, no planting <laughs> at all on those properties. And so it's really noticeable now when you look from an aerial that, you know, we're, and to be fair, you have to point the finger at the state. You know, if the state is going to house people, they need to house people with good living standards simply planting a few trees around properties would have made a huge difference to those areas and you know would 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 provide benefits for many decades to come i think the you know kayanga ore is really bought into that now they they realize that you know tree planting is very important they need to create you know sustainable and livable communities um, and providing that connection to nature helps that. So, you know, the, the wheels are turning slowly in the right direction. I think, you know, some of these bigger um, development entities are now starting to look at planting, but there's a lot to do, to be honest. You know, if you look at Kaipadaki, that's got 30% canopy cover, and you look at Otara, that's got eight. That's a huge difference. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of trees that we need to plant to even get close to bringing that canopy cover up. So, you know, it's it's a really it interesting, isn't it? But I think we, we need to encourage people to think positively. You know, the more mm. that they can do, the more that we plant, the more that we can get schools involved with, you know, understanding the value of our native trees and our, yeah. um, the more that we're going to see positive outcomes. You know, the, the Mayor's Million Trees, a lot of the planting that we did through that program was through volunteers. Yeah. We've had some great questions come in. Um, I've got one here from um, uh, Adam Forbes, uh, Dr. Adam Forbes, who was on our show last week. And he's just asking Jackie in particular, is there scope for people to think broader than just Manuka and Kanuka regarding uh, honey? Um, hang on, I pressed the wrong button. Um, and I'll, um, Oh, the question's disappeared, but um, I think possibly because Jackie's answered it. But tell us now, Jackie, what, what is the answer to that question? Yes, I, I just wish I could um, dish away to my cupboards and pull out some really unique um, honey that's been produced in Uruweras. We'll take your word um, for it, Jackie. They're, they're, yeah, they're there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there are some very unique honeys that um, are produced in, in New Zealand, and it would be really good to for them to have a higher profile. 
Uh, this is something, this is an industry that is got so many benefits. Um, it's, you know, you, you're using um, intact forest for us as doing a sustainable um, industry. And um, yeah, honey is good for you. And yeah. it's good. So yeah, there's many of our species that um, um, are good for honey. And there's a real opportunity to profile some of the boutique industries and the unique honeys that our country has and raise the profile of them. I mean, we've got Manuka honey, of course, and that's raised the profile of honey in New Zealand, but we've got more than Manuka honey. Indeed. I, yeah. um, I, I had a, a Karaka vodka the other day and I can attest that it was, it was, it was excellent. The bits I can remember. Another question here from um, Robin Simcock. Uh, saying, yes, there have been a million seedlings planted in public land in Auckland, but do we have any data, this is probably for you, Hal, um, do we have any data on how many have successfully established to the age of three or five? An observation is that many of the seedlings planted on public land have not yet established. Their trunks have been damaged by mowers and weed eaters, by cars, trailers, big bins, and in many cases, no money was spent to ensure that their soil was decompacted. Great question. Thank you, Robin. Great to hear your passion out there. Um, Robin and I share horror stories around some of the damage that we see by, you know, mowers and weed eaters, etc. on suburban street trees. It's it's quite distressing on times. A lot of, I mean, in some cases, and I, and I guess I'm just looking generally here, um, a lot of the planting that we did through the Mayor's Million Trees program was in regional parks and was in local parks where those sorts of issues aren't so challenging. So we're looking a lot of the planting was revegetation, you know, small seedlings, uh, one and two litre grades. Uh -huh. um, the areas are then, you know, maintained in a slightly different way. They're generally not mown. Um, whereas the, the issues that Robin is talking about is more the, I guess, community based plantings where we have individual standalone trees planted in our reserves. It is incredibly challenging. Um, and I'm the first one to put my hand up and say it's it's very frustrating on times to be involved in plantings, to then see them, you know, trashed by our own contractors that are um, serving another part of the maintenance contract in terms of mowing grass. Um, I know Kiwis love their lawn mowers and they love their Saturday morning lawn mowing and all of that stuff that goes along with it. But to me, the mowers are one of the biggest enemies of, of trying to establish trees within urban areas. Mm. And the weed eater is just absolutely devastating. From, I, I constantly, I've got thousands of photographs, if I'm honest with you, of the damage that's been done to trees, you know, both young and old, by mowers, um, mm. mowers and weed eaters. And leaves little bits of plastic wherever it goes. Exactly, exactly. It's not good. You know, I, I think we need to change our habits there, to be honest. We need uh, to invest more in, in, you know, looking after what we plant. It goes with what you were saying around tree intelligence. At the same time as having some tree intelligence, we also need to have intelligence about how to look after the their, the environment that they sit in. Yeah. Um, and wouldn't it be great to be rid of lawns? Paula Warren asks, I'm a botanist and an artist. I want native trees to be used in restoration, but I also want my city to have natives... Um, and to be and to have an arboretum where I can see a wide range of trees, collect fruits, coloured leaves for collage, needles, weavings, and so on. And I want to see an urban arboretum labelled so I can work out what trees they are. This sort of goes to this um, kind of you know falling back in love with trees, doesn't it? And and it kind of maybe I don't know. This is one for you. Um, there are so many more things we can do with trees than just look at them. We could. Um, uh, you know, you talked about Rongana and also about, um, you know, the um, indigenous arts that might come from re-engaging with forests. What, what ways are you seeing people, I suppose, re-engage with them at a artistic and at a medicinal level? Um, yes, yeah, so I think one of the core um, principles for Kaitiakitanga is about the use and engagement with resources. So it's really encouraged that people go out and um, use other cultural practices to engage with um, the different tree species um, in their areas. Um, and some of the findings from our research have shown that people are using them for rong, um, using plant species for rongwa for medicines, um, for weaving. Um, for food, for carving, and so on. And so it, 
it's um, not only the um, native species that we're seeing um, people collect, but they're also incorporating new things that highly align with um, environmental and sustainable practices. So we're mm. using materials um, to produce um, new forms of art and weaving. Um, and so it's it's really clear from my research that people are really thinking ahead about um, not only sustaining those um, native species, but how to um, kind of use the the materials that we we don't really like in our um, ecosystems, such as plastics and so on, to create mm. those those art forms. A question here, and um, this kind of opens up a different area of discussion as well, from Keith Dark. Um, maybe how this is one for you. How do you deal with power lines and fire risk for your urban planting? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, in in terms of tree selection, obviously we we are looking at applying more of that right tree, right place. Um, we're a lot more fortunate now in terms of a lot of the development that we deal with in so, you know more suburbia. The power lines are actually put underground, so a lot of supplies are now um, in the, um, the footpaths or in the grass verges. Um, we've got a um, code of practice that now encourages um, utilities to be put in their own separated berm. Um, well away from where we would use it as a tree planting. So, you know, encouraging those sorts of principles, um, looking forward in terms of how do we manage what we currently have. Um, we may look to grow smaller, you know, plant smaller growing species underneath power lines. Um, we do what's called channel pruning. So we, we prune the middles out of trees to try and provide um, clearances. Um, it's very challenging. Fire risk is not generally a huge issue that we have to deal with in Auckland. Our temperate maritime climate doesn't normally present too many issues around fire. Um, we do have the odd instances of trees catching fire around power lines in the Waitakere's, which is obviously one of our biggest challenges, uh, one of Vector's biggest challenges, is managing the power lines where they run through the um, much more native forest and bush areas, which are you know a lot harder to get to. So um generally speaking though um you know we you know it's it's a challenging one that we try and encourage the power authorities to look at what other options are there you know there's things called abc now which is an aerial bundled cable which rather than your three cables running individually they are now in one cable which you know reduces the amount of trimming that we need to do for trees um and yeah we've got a pretty good working relationship with vector um, and counties, um, Manukau. I mean, they, they rely, you know, their main priority is to provide power to citizens. And as we all know, when the power goes out, people aren't happy. Um, and if trees are responsible, trees get a little bit of a bad name. And so, you know, there's a there's a definite sort of tension between tree owners and power line owners. Um, has been for many decades. Um, I think it's something that we really need to just, you know get on with, um, accept the fact that we need trees in urban areas and accept the fact that we need power lines and accept the fact that we've got, you know, skilled people that can manage them to grow, you know, I guess not hand in hand because they can't touch each other, but at least grow um, collaboratively. So, you know, for my side of things, you know, fire risk is really very, very low. I've, I've only come across a couple of instances of trees being on fire with power lines, but as I say, mostly in rural areas. Uh, Jackie, one of the topics you mentioned um, is the resistance that native forests can offer uh, to fire, um, if not resistance, at least lower risk. And again, one of these kind of non-timber benefits that as the world heats up, um, that good stands of native forests can offer us as a country. Ah, kia ora. I'm glad you mentioned that, Vincent. So uh, native forest, if it's intact and healthy, is indeed quite fire resistant. I mean, I think we've all stepped into um, healthy native forests and felt the coolness and the, the microclimate there. Um, some of our native species are quite flammable, particularly manuka and kanuka, but in, um, the complex native forest that we all love, um, that is largely fire resistant. But if you Google... Um, um, there is the uh, Rural Fire Service has got guidelines about what flammable species um, you can use um, and what species you shouldn't use, but yes, you can create green fire belts. And this is something that's been done overseas a lot, particularly China. They've put in huge investment into creating green fire belts because they want to future-proof their um, agricultural land, their 
their forests, their um, rural populations, and, and, and try to prevent the spread of, of fire. So green fire bounce, yes, and using native species, um, you've got the benefit also of creating ecological corridors, um, all the benefits for biodiversity, for all, all cultural services, pollination services, etc. So it, it makes a lot of sense and it's something that we need to be thinking about more and particularly planting around our peri um, urban areas, um, which you know can be vulnerable to fire. So mm. that, you know, in different parts of our landscape and in protecting resources, um, horticultural areas, plantation forests. Yeah, green fire belts have um, a lot going for them. <laughs> Keith Dark has made a comment that Himalayan spruce in Australia in the Australian Arboretum withstood the huge Canberra fires. Yeah, I think. Though for us, our native species, um, we, if we plant um, and keep intact our native forest, that's our existing native forest, make sure it's healthy, protecting it from, from pests um, in particular, then, you know, we're, we're um, creating um, fire, fire, fire bouts and reducing fire risk. But, yeah, and also creating um, plantings of green fire bouts makes a lot of sense. I think we should be using our native species because of all the other merit of um, benefits that, that come along with them. Yeah. Look, we are um, out of time. There are so many benefits to talk about and um, we haven't exhausted them, I'm sure. So um, there are there is a ton more information on the Pure Advantage website that you can go and read. Please do engage. Please do ask questions. Uh, this is a dialogue, so we're hoping to overall lift, lift the level of intelligence and debate around our Nahiri. Um, so um, next week, I'm going to do a little ad for next week. Next week, we're going to look specifically about the benefits brought to the climate change issue, both from a um, sequestration point of view, but also from uh, a biodiversity point of view, because of course climate change is, is itself a subset of a bigger problem around our loss of habitat and biodiversity. So um, that's next week. We're going to be a very interesting discussion about um, how we use and benefit from our Nahiri in a climate change affected world. But uh, for now, let me thank our guests, Elena Walker, uh, Hal Davies, and Dr. Jackie Amos. Thank you so much for participating in this discussion. Thank you also to all the guests who have joined us and asked questions. Anyway, that's us for tonight. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to the crew, and uh, thank you to our guests. Enohara. Hey,